It sort of feels like magic um, that you could somehow set up a decentralized uh, system with lots of ind people, ind independent individuals who are not coordinated, delivering a great outcome. And yet, that's actually how the internet itself started, right? Um, when, as, as you and I are talking, um, the information that we are exchanging with each other, you know, our, our voice and the video is broken up into lots of little bits and encrypted and shot all over routers that are run by millions of people all around the world, and you don't know who they are, and you don't care. Um, and you don't care that the information that I'm sending you right now is different than, is going over different routers than the information I was sending you a minute ago. Um, and that's because it, it, it's almost, almost, by design, you, you, you say rather than trying to have a few good things run really well, you, you build to assume there are failures. I mean, you build a system in a decentralized way, you assume that there can be failures but you build it in a resilient way. Um, and just as the internet makes things possible that you know, a centralized communications network run by AT&T could never have achieved, uh, I think you're going to see the same thing with cloud computing, decentralized cloud computing, and decentralized cloud storage. There are a lot of common misconceptions that people have about decentralized cloud storage. Probably the one we hear the most frequently is that uh, you know, what happens if a uh, if one of the storage nodes goes offline? Do I lose, lose access to my data? And the the, uh, the example people always give us is, if grandma is running this on her computer at home and she turns the lights out and the computer goes off, um, what happens to my data? And within a, uh, a decentralized network, sort of there's, there's two layers that are going on. One is that when data is stored there, there's a, a process uh, in which the storage nodes are constantly audited, uh, particularly on our network, to make sure that they are storing the data that they're supposed to be storing. And there's a whole incentive structure there that is designed to, to elicit the behavior from storage nodes that, that nobody tries to you know, commit uh, ransomware attacks or frauds, or if they do, they're easily detected. In addition to the incentive model, there's a layer of redundancy built in. So when an upload uh, occurs, a file is broken up into a number of pieces. Uh, currently, we use 80 pieces. And of those 80 pieces, you only need 29 to get your file back, and it's any 29. So at any given time, 51 of those storage nodes could be offline, uh, compromised, destroyed, or, uh, or Byzantine, which means they're, they're trying to defraud the network. But ultimately, your file is still available. And the probability that 51 nodes would go offline at, at one time is astronomically uh, low. And so what that means is that you, um, even if one node goes offline, five nodes goes offline, your data is still available. But at the same time, the system is keeping track of ones that do go offline. And even without the encryption keys, data can be healed. So pieces can be recreated and redistributed to new storage nodes. And so if the data is ever at risk where the system detects that there are too few storage nodes uh, storing a piece, then it just simply uh, recreates those pieces and regenerates them, distributes them back to the network. And so they become highly available again. I think one of the biggest challenges that the centralized storage is going to have to overcome is the positioning around where your data is physically stored. Ultimately, your data is protected by math in a way that is uh, incredibly secure and incredibly safe, and that is better than any physical location than you could put it. People think a lot about physical location when they're storing their data, but really they shouldn't be. Um, computers are connected to the internet. When a computer is connected to the internet, it's reachable from everywhere. Uh, uh, when, when there are vulnerabilities in firewall software or uh, edge perimeter software, um, there is a risk that your data is reachable by anywhere. Um, and so, you know, putting your data in a data center that has guards isn't really any safer than putting your data anywhere else. Um, if your computer is connected to the internet, then it's sort of on the information highway. Um, I think people are worried about decentralized storage because it feels a little bit like putting your most private and secret data under your neighbor's bed. Um, it's in their house. It's like you don't really know where you've put the data. Um, and so decentralized storage really needs to figure out how to overcome this messaging hurdle of people think about their data physically 
when really they should be thinking about where their data is virtually, how their data is configured virtually with math, with protection, with encryption. The encryption matters so much more than the physical location. Another common myth is that it's slow um, because people look and go, wow, if you have to distribute all these pieces all over the network and then go and get them back and put them back together again and you have encryption and then you have this whole blockchain thing, it sounds slow. And uh, frankly, that's what I thought too the first time I heard the idea. Uh, but then I looked at it and I realized that um, it, it's actually amazingly performant. And the reason is because of uh, you get to take advantage of this massive parallelism. So instead of downloading a single file from a single location and in, in sort of just serializing that transfer, what you get is this parallelism where a, uh, a, an endpoint can download all of the pieces from 29 different nodes or 30 different nodes or 100 different nodes in parallel all at the same time. And so there are no bottlenecks. You're only limited by the bandwidth um, where, where the actual download is occurring. And so if you're in a high bandwidth area, you can really get massive uh, performance out of that parallelism. And so it, it's amazing that um, when you have an environment where the, um, the whole premise of decentralized cloud storage is that it's dependent on a lot of available bandwidth. Um, so it's a bandwidth constrained environment for decentralized storage. But what that also means, it's a bandwidth enabled environment. And so if there's high bandwidth and there's lots of uh, storage nodes out there and we have lots of storage nodes and lots of bandwidth available, the amount of performance you can get out of it is astonishing. I guess the, uh, the last area is the, the complexity. You know, people look at decentralized applications as almost the Rube Goldberg machine of, of doing anything. And, and in a lot of cases, the early decentralized projects were sort of the more complicated, uh, harder to figure out way of doing something that already existed without a whole lot of additional benefit. And what we found with um, decentralized cloud storage, particularly the way we executed is we've really focused on the developer experience. And so we've made it super easy to get all of these advantages of decentralized cloud storage, the enhanced privacy, the enhanced security, the enhanced performance, the great economics without uh, creating a huge layer of complexity for developers. We're S3 compatible. We take credit cards so you can just uh, swipe a card and get going. We have a free tier. We look for all the world like every other service that you're using today, except with none of those uh, significant drawbacks and easy to use and all the benefits. While it takes a lot to create a network like this and keep it running, from the developer standpoint, it's very easy to use and uh, it's very easy to get started. Uh, and I would encourage any developer to, to sign up for free trial and get started today. Mm -hmm.